This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff. I hope you enjoy it. Please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Awesome. And we're live. Welcome to the podcast, folks. Today, being joined by Bradford and Brian from Two Blind Brothers. Where are you guys at the moment? So we're both in uh, Central Virginia, where we grew up, and uh, we sort of we sort of fled uh, New York City probably two or three weeks ago, which is perfect timing. Crazy. So it's had it's pretty bad there at the moment. Yeah, yeah, we we ran away before it could get too bad. <laughs> but our friends that are still there are are telling some very interesting stories about it empty streets in new york which is more eerie than the halloween parade yeah same in london like it used to you used to i'm used to it being so busy and then you like walk around a little bit we're allowed out for maybe like maximum an hour a day for a bit of exercise uh and then you walk around and the air's clean and there's no one around it's quite it's quite interesting yeah no one no one's screaming at you subway cars wide open it really it's it's a it's 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 a ghost town up there i'm hearing it's weird yeah it's really weird i just can't help but feeling that it's like mother nature just saying to us humans like you stay in your room for a few months because you've been messing me up so badly and i'm going to sort myself out and if you don't behave, I'll make you stay in your room a little bit longer. It's just like it's just a funny, uh, it's a funny one, right? When you're when you're faced with this natural natural things, like it's quite humbling, right? There's like nothing you can do about it. Yeah, yeah really key. Oh, go ahead, Bradford. I was I, I was gonna say I, I'm really curious to see what the downstream consequences are. I mean, do we change the? You know, we're obviously get to spend a lot more time with uh, you know talking to our close friends and family. Um, it has you reflect on things that you normally don't get to do. And um, I'm just curious to see if it changes our culture at all in the way that, you know, from everything about the way we, you know, sort of approach our, our relationships to, you know, wh- whether we'll go to those movie theaters, concerts and big events in the same way. Yeah, it's true. It's true. A lot of people talk about, you know, they want a better balance in life, you know, or they want to spend more time with their family, more time with their kids and stuff like that. I've been speaking to my mates and they're like, I'm spending so much time with my kids. I can't wait to go back to work because it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy. But I think, you know, I think if we're, if we're, if we're off and at home for like a long period of time, like maybe, I know, six months, then I think definitely like we'll change a lot the way we do things um if it's just like a month or two you can see people drifting back in but i think the work from home thing's quite interesting i don't know about you guys and uh, and we'll hear a little bit about how you guys are structured and stuff but certainly in the uk have been a lot of talk about working from home and flexible working and stuff like that and and this could certainly be the trigger for more people uh, doing that yeah it's been great um you know i think it's actually given us a chance to sort of step back and actually earlier this year and towards the end of last year, we were actually working on streamlining a lot of things. And so this, uh, we we obviously weren't expecting to be in the situation we're in, but to be able to um, kind of test, you know, our our own ability to sort of work remotely has been very fascinating because um, it's gone smoother than expected, you know, and uh, for uh, obviously for some unique reasons, uh, on our end, but uh, but so far so good. So when when did you guys like kind of leave the office and and kind of go work from home? Well, I would say probably probably three weeks ago. 
probably uh, the first week in um, March uh, when when the cases started picking up a little bit in New York. Um, yeah. and, and you know, we we have an extraordinarily small team. It's really just well, at this point, it's it's really four of us internally. We obviously have a lot of outsourced help as well, and different. Yeah. Uh, you know, service providers, uh, but the core team is only four of us. So, so it, 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 awesome. the, it wasn't a, a logistical nightmare for us. Great. And let, let's just circling back. So what's, what are your backgrounds? I, Brad and I both uh, graduated from the University of Virginia and yeah. Brad went up to New York and worked in finance where he was at a uh, small private equity space before uh, Two Blind Brothers. I worked in data sales for a number of years before kind of start stepping into this crazy adventure. Nice. How did it all come about? Um, so, you know, Brian and I have a rare eye condition called Stargardt's disease, and it's a juvenile form of macular degeneration where you lose your center vision over time. You keep a lot of your peripheral vision usually. And um, it's something we've had our whole lives. And when we were both living in New York City, we had this, um, just this day where we were walking around shopping. And if you uh, know anyone who's visually impaired or blind, you know, and especially for Brian and I, shopping can be a giant pain. Uh, you can't see the sizes, the colors, the labels that well. So, you, you know, what we have done is just kind of run our hands over a shirt that we think we like, if we really like the quality of it and it, from what we can see of it, it looks good, then we'll do the rest of the work to figure out if we want to buy it. And um, we were, we happened to be in a Bloomingdale's. We ended up leaving coincidentally uh, with the exact same shirt and, <laughs> it, it, and it got us talking. We had no prior experience in clothing or fashion, um, yeah. but we thought maybe this could be our aha moment to help the organizations that we're so passionate about as it relates to um, retinal eye disease and looking for potential cures for these conditions. And one of the things that they really struggle with is to put a consumer face to make tangible um, these scientific achievements. And uh, this was our way of kind of bringing that into a more tangible consumer facing experience, as well as being able to make the softest shirts in the world that we possibly could. So that was how we got the initial idea. Awesome. And then so and so your profits go to to charity. So you donate them um, to the charity to the charities that you support. Yeah. So 100 percent of our profits go back to, you know, these organizations that are focusing on early stage retinal researchers. And that's okay. that's and we and we really like these early people, because as anybody knows, or one of my favorite examples, you know, if you gave 20 grand to Coca-Cola, they probably wouldn't notice. But if you yeah. gave 20 grand to a soda startup, that would mean the difference between them being able to actually grow and succeed and fail. And these yeah. early researchers are at a lot of great universities and institutions who just need a little capital to get the proof of concept of their, of their treatment, of their methodology, of the, the drug they're working on, so that then they can go out and seek big grants from you know, larger institutions or, or you know, big pharma companies so that then they can do all of the additional work. But we like really focusing when they're young, when they're hungry, and when the dollar goes as far as possible. Awesome, that's really cool. So, so on, on the entrepreneur side, did you, did you always want to start a business? Yeah, I mean, I think we've always had entrepreneurial tendencies. Uh, you know, one of the funny things about this project is it we had no business aspirations for it when we started right. it. It was purely out of fun and a commitment to help, um, you know, organizations like the Foundation Fighting Blindness. We, yeah. we, we figured we'd make a couple hundred shirts uh, with some help from friends that worked in the fashion industry. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we'd, we'd sell them to our friends and, and, and it would be, that would be it. We've been very, uh, pleasantly surprised, um, by some of the momentum that we've gotten on it. Um, but, but we, you know, for us from a, from an entrepreneurial perspective and from a personal perspective, you know, it, it, it felt like a success from the day that we started working on it because it was just all about, um, you know, having fun with each other, empowering the community and trying yeah. to do, give some goodwill back to these uh, 
organization. So it, it's been a very interesting experience in that sense. Amazing. Is, is the is the um, the journey what you expected? Like founding a company, building <laughs> something like this. I mean, I guess what what did you expect going into it, and what's it actually been like? Well, I'll tell you, as Brad said, the expectations were very low uh going in we were just it was more of a nights and weekends you know learn a little bit about fashion learn a bit about retail learn a little bit about e-commerce and marketing with with and you know so the expectations were so low that every success felt like a huge win yeah but along with that every time that we were successful and we grew the business would absolutely break down in different <laughs> ways every single time we were for shipping packages out of our out of the apartment where we were running the office and doing everything which just turned into an absolute disaster so then we had to find a fulfillment center and then we had to find you know then we were selling more shirts than we possibly could keep up with so then we had to find a new cut and sew facility then we needed more team members then we needed more ideas and we needed more it's just every three months every time the business would double or grow substantially something would break and yeah. you know, onto the entrepreneurship front, everyone talks about it all the time. But yeah. when you go from working at a big corporate environment, you have a really, you have a swim lane. You have, hey, here's your job. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's what success is. Here's what failure is. You know, go out and do it. Yeah. But when you're running a business, as, as you know, every job is your job, and every job is important. And you know, prioritizing time, prioritizing tasks becomes really hard because everything is inside of the realm of possibility yeah. and you know forcing yourself to do stuff you don't like to do just because it has to get done it was one of the, like the more slap in the face lessons that you get <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny like when you start a business you end up being everything right you're like finance sales hr the cleaner like <laughs> in a, ev everything right and you just have to like roll your sleeves up and get stuck in um and uh and often you can be working longer harder and for less money than you were before right you know in well, your big company. You, i can tape a box faster than probably anybody in the country <laughs> Hone skill. you just you just got to do it right it's uh, and 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 that's what you got to do and then and then obviously as you start to, uh, to to build out and assign jobs to different people and, and organize yourselves then it starts to get a little bit um i say proper but you know it starts to kind of establish itself i think yeah you're repaid with uh satisfaction a lot more than anything else yeah, yeah, definitely where are you where are you guys manufacturing is it local the us or well we we've changed several times and it's, it kind of depends on our products we do some manufacturing in los angeles uh a lot of our manufacturing comes from los angeles we do some manufacturing in china but actually the most interesting uh part of our manufacturing process are our um, blindness related uh, organization partners um, like Industries for the Blind and previously Dallas Lighthouse for the Blind. Once we started to get a little momentum on this project, um, we had a couple of these organizations reach out to us and we couldn't, we, we didn't actually believe that this type of thing existed. We were, and it fit 100% perfectly into what we were trying to build. Um, there are some charitable organizations you know, here in the US that do uh, production, a lot of it is government contract work, but, but the organizations are have a majority or, you know, up to at least 70% visually impaired and blind workers. Oh, wow. So, so we were able to um, negotiate with them to be our production partners. So, you know, when, when you get some of the products fr from our line, they're, they're actually uh, assembled, uh, constructed and put together by uh, folks that come from our community, which was just a, a total win-win for for us. Very cool. Did you did you know that before you started, or that you just ended up kind of bumping into them as you as you got going? No, we didn't. We had no idea. Uh, once somebody said, "Hey, we'd love to help you manufacture," we're like, "Great, we do need help." And they're like, "Oh, by the <laughs> way, our workforce is all blind and visually impaired." We're like, "You're hired." <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> amazing amazing so most of it's there in 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 the us and then china you just see you've been manufacturing there as a, a slightly different supply yeah, chain. Whether, you know whether it's some of our accessories or labels or tags you know um, yeah, yeah, yeah. there definitely uh are some good partners over there for for things that that awesome. are part of our line i'll tell you <laughs> the the button manufacturer market in the us is not substantial uh right, it okay. doesn't necessarily exist Fair enough. And then and are you selling all online or are you also selling uh, like wholesale to retailers and stuff? We are entirely online. Uh, we, in which we truly, we, we love for a lot of reasons, but most is that, you know, a lot of our products, they are soft, they are incredible, they are amazing, but they come with such a story and such a sense of, of community and purpose. And yeah. when you're on a rack at a store, some brands can do a really good job at this, but you know, we like people knowing what they're buying and having that experience of shopping with us and, and understanding the story and the good that the product they're purchasing is doing. And that yeah. can lose translation when you're just another shirt on a shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And, 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 and how have you found on selling online? Um, so in terms of kind of the marketing and cause it's quite, um, it's quite competitive there. We've, um, we've been very, very lucky, um, early on in, uh, our project. We, we had some friends that were pretty sophisticated at a lot of social media advertising and, right. you know, essentially a lot of our content and marketing, doesn't really mention the products in great detail. Um, we are oftentimes talking about the story uh, behind the brand or the st or a particular kind of shopping experience that we've we've created called the the shop blind experience. But um, it, it is extraordinarily competitive. Um, but it, it's actually forced us to lean into what makes us unique. And yeah. um, what we do find is what is really competitive are are, are the companies that hire, you know, big brand name ad agencies, uh, do these overly produced commercials or motion graphics, um, yeah. you know, but being able to sort of tell your story in, in an authentic and raw way uh, it, it is a way to out compete in, in a certain respect. 100%. No, 100%. 100%. What's been, what's been the hardest thing you guys have faced since you started? Working with each other. Uh, really? That's a, that's a, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, that, was my that, that was my next question. <laughs> uh, well, I like being a little preemptive. <laughs> I would say the hardest thing that we faced, uh, I would say two things. One is a little bit of the unpredictability of what's going to, what's going to break next yeah. and just then needing to, to clean up that mess uh, or, or fix that problem as swiftly as possible. And two uh, I would say is frankly, we've just had a problem with selling out and just having, you know, really, really challenging. Right. I think a lot of early brands have this, especially when you're growing a lot, how to predict growth when you don't have a ton of data behind it. You know, like yes. if you're Coke, you know what you're going to sell next month, but if you yeah. grew X percent last year, there's no indication of if it's going to be double that half that or 10 X that, you know, next year. Yeah, no, true. And how how how's COVID affected you guys so far? Um, you know, truthfully, we've held up pretty well. Um, by nature, right. by nature of the fact that we are all online, and and we do a lot of um, advertising on on um, social media networks, which people are spending a bit more time on. Uh, we have been quite concerned that our fulfillment center. Uh, where we ship all of our inventory um, would shut down, uh, but I, I think so far so good, and so okay. so fingers crossed, we we've held up um, fine during during this time. Brilliant, brilliant. So you haven't really had to kind of pivot too quickly or change change the strategy quite yet. Um, you know, we're kind of always on our toes because you know what what do what do we do or what's the messaging if the fulfillment center shuts down? What happens yeah. if people stop purchasing uh, because they're getting uh, you know their uh, that because the economy is sort of falling out? I mean, to be fair, you know, our, our business, you know, buying clothing that's attached to a cause is not as important to some people as paying rent or feeding their family. You know, go figure. So. Yeah. 
you know, so yeah. we're right now we're sort of in strategizing and putting in backup plans in place. Um, luckily, yeah. we haven't had to pivot that hard, but that but that's what we've been up to recently. Yeah, no, no, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, now, just going, circling back, you joked about, you know, the hardest thing being working together. And uh, I speak to a lot of people that have founded business with the, with businesses with the co-founder. How, how have you found, obviously, you two are brothers, but, but how are you finding working together both as, as founders? Have you, have you segregated your roles and how, how have you organized yourselves? Yeah, I mean, it's it has its uh, it definitely has its advantages. I think most businesses, and I know there's a lot of data out there that say businesses that start with co-founders are are oftentimes more successful than ones that start individually. Because as you know, we spoke about at the beginning of this podcast, there's not you know there's a lot of work, and if you can split it two ways and you can bounce ideas back and forth, you can end up in usual better places. You know, Brad and I, it, the nice part is being brothers and growing up together, having this eye disease together. And, you know, we had run small, very small businesses before together, just as larks more than anything. Yeah. We think pretty similarly. And yeah. which is really helpful for when you're trying to convey an idea, the other one can seem to get there quickly. Not to say that we haven't disagreed, but, you know, the one of the big tenants is when we were starting this we sat down and had a long conversation about you know backing down and letting the other one be right and you know putting the relationship over the business when necessary you know yeah. and you have to you have to understand too as two brothers we have a lot of practice fighting with each other <laughs> that's true that's very so, true you, you think you know it's like maybe brian disagrees with what i project our sales to be but um, it's not as bad as when he hit, hit me with a vacuum cleaner when I was 12 years old. So, uh, that, so we do have practice. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I love that. Um, so in terms of like how you organize your day, like a, a lot of a lot of people when they start a business, it's just like so much stuff, right? Like super chaotic. And how how have you guys like gone about structuring and organizing your day? You know, so it's changed recently. It's so dynamic. The problems change every few weeks, for sure. So yeah. it, it's sometimes hard. Uh, and when and and that played into our hiring. You know, we would bring in people who were just good team players who could be flexible and interested in learning new things. And, and we would sort of do it around, you know, weekly meetings and weekly agendas. You know, uh, about yeah. what we were sort of focusing on. Um, last year, we experimented with a lot of new marketing techniques. Uh, this year, we've sort of zeroed in on something that's been working really, really well for us. And, um, and, and so that's, that's kind of how we've, uh, we've organized ourselves is, is this year, we have some very clear kind of yearly goals. Uh, we have yeah. a, sort of a, a sort of a way that we market our brand right now that we're laser focused on and, and everything sort of re revolves around that right now uh, while right. we try to move everything else, um, all uh, uh, try to get all the other distractions out of the way. Yeah, brilliant. What, what are your plans for the future, the next year or two? Cure blindness, of course. You know, we're really trying to yeah. fast track that one in. Uh, <laughs> that seems, are, that's more, are we, are we far away, do you think? Or? Uh, uh, you know, it's, it depends on how you define it. Because there's a disease called LCA, labor congenital amaurosis, which causes blindness in about 2,500 kids in the U.S. every single year. And they, this past year, they created a cure that, turns the lights back on, not even just goes wow. from blind to sighted, but from reading braille to reading print, Jesus. which is magic. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's that. And that took from about 1996 until to, until last year to fully get through all of the processes and approvals. But for a lot of these diseases, we are on the five yard line for curing blindness, right. which is a crazy right. statement. But you're, you know, there's something like 30, clinical trials going on right now in the retinal eye disease space and right. it is really one of the hot areas for scientists just because it's so fascinating so cutting edge and so out there that you're getting some of the greatest minds in the world that are dedicating their lives to these diseases and have been doing so for 40 years <laughs> and we're about to see 
the fruits of all of that labor uh, come true. Amazing. So, so it's it's like really been recently then that the funding's gone in, um, and and the research has really started to take off. Yeah, I mean, anybody who's following medicine, you know, it, we're living through a medical revolution right now. The science has come so far. Gene therapy, stem cell therapy, gene editing. I mean, these yeah. things. The, yeah. These things are just flooding, you, you know, flooding through right now. And, um, and the eye for a variety of reasons happens to be a very good candidate organ uh, for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these new therapies. Um, it's immunoprotected um, from uh, the rest of the body. Obviously, there's two eyes. So you can, you know, in a clinical trial, you can do something to one. So, so for a variety yeah. of reasons, the eye is, um, is actually seeing a lot of these advanced uh, therapies early on and and it's really exciting amazing awesome well look great to speak to you guys um sounds like you both are doing some great work and uh keep it up and uh you know be interesting to touch base after all this has happened and uh and see what's going on see where the world ends up yeah yeah well look both stay safe stay healthy um and look forward to speaking to you again soon yeah thanks thanks so much you know it's because of uh people like you and podcasts like this that our, our projects been lifted up to what it is so so we're, we're grateful to be included and um we really enjoy it so th thank you pleasure no thank you so much thank you so much all right talk soon my friend awesome take care see you later hey folks thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places